Thank you so much. I'm I'm glad the invitation got through. I know these these Zoom invitations in the inbox can be a nightmare. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Morgan. I'm always happy to see you. And I get to meet Paige Cottingham Streeter after all this time. I'm so excited. <laughs> so you know now lovely to meet you. Now that we're all here and there's a a, a bunch of uh, people who have joined us, um, uh, I think it makes sense to go ahead and uh, get started. Mm -hmm. um, let me just just open things up by saying, um, again, I'm Morgan Patelka. I'm chair of the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. I'm a professor of Japanese history, and it's my great honor uh, to welcome today um, Paige Cottingham Streeter. But uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Barbara Stevenson, uh, who is the Vice Provost for Global Affairs and Chief Global Officer of UNC Chapel Hill, um, and who has come to the university and just helped us to really um, reimagine our role in the world and the impact that we can have through global education and global engagement in ways that I didn't believe were possible. Uh, and I'm so thankful to you, Barbara, for the work you've already been doing and all the work that we will all be doing together in the years ahead. Um, so let me turn it over to you uh, for a few minutes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. That's such a kind um, introduction. I really do appreciate that. Um, let me just thank Morgan and the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies for hosting today's event and for inviting Paige Cottingham Streeter to share her experience and expertise with us. You know, UNC Chapel Hill has quite the history with Japan, and it's one that we've been nurturing for more than a century. We love to tell the story that the first ever international student to study at UNC came here from Tokyo and attended the university for the 1893 to 1894 school year. And since then, we've hosted hundreds of students and scholars from Japan and sent hundreds more from Carolina to Japan to study. But our relationship extends beyond study abroad and international student and scholar exchanges. When I first came to UNC in 2019, I noticed a framed tile on the wall just outside of the suite to my office. It's small and plain, but if you look closely, the plaque that accompanies it tells a powerful story. In 1951, UNC Chapel Hill sent books to the Hiroshima University Library after it was damaged in the atomic bombing that led to the end of World War II. 60 years later, Carolina University leaders were presented with roof tiles that had been scorched by the bomb and recovered in riverbeds throughout the town. These tiles were given as a token of remembrance and also gratitude from Hiroshima University for the books donated after the war. In some ways, these tiles tell our history and they also remind us of the value of friendship a friendship that has endured for decades following that painful war. Our friendship with Japan is evident in a variety of ways throughout our campus and curriculum. Currently, there are more than 50 faculty members across campus conducting research related to Japan in fields ranging from economics to medicine to art. And since 2011, Carolina researchers have co-authored at least 886 publications with researchers in Japan. And in addition to the outstanding programming offered by the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and the Carolina Asia Center, our campus also has six Carolina student organizations related to Japanese language or culture. And the Ackland Art Museum has the Southeast largest collection of Japanese art. Something that may be a little less obvious is that we also have the best Japanese studies program in the entire American Southeast. Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> this friendship already has roots that are deep and wide, and we're not done yet. We have 21 agreements currently active or under development with 12 Japanese universities, and we're pushing forward with an ambitious Asia strategy that prioritizes building and deepening relations with Japan. Our students, 
Carolina students, their demand for Japanese studies classes has remained robust and our Japanese language levels have stayed strong and consistent. We want to meet the needs of our students by strengthening our ties and increasing opportunities to learn with and from faculty, researchers, and students in Japan. We've started this process in part through our new Collaborative Online International Learning, or COIL, program at UNC. With support from the American Council on Education, Sharon Cannon, a professor of management and corporate communication at Keenan Flagler Business School, is teaching a COIL course this semester in partnership with a faculty member at Sophia University in Tokyo. I hope that this is just the first partnership of many between faculty members at Carolina and faculty members at Japanese universities, virtually connecting our students and content across geographic borders. We also wanna make the most of rare opportunities like today, opportunities to learn from experts in US-Japan relations like our distinguished guest today, Paige Cottingham Streeter. There's no doubt that racial inequality has shaped the American experience. And I so appreciate this opportunity to learn more about the connection between the Black American experience and US-Japan relations. Morgan, thank you for bringing Paige to us as part of the Department of Asian American and Middle Eastern Studies Speaker Series. And I'm gonna hand it back to you now, Morgan, with thanks and ask you to introduce our honored guest today. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, so, I just want to say quickly that this series, this speaker series, which is called, let me, let me change the spotlight. There we go. Uh, this speaker series, which is called Blackness in Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, is a year long speaker series that uh, invites a variety of academics and professionals with deep uh, engagement, in some cases teaching and scholarship, in some cases pro professional work in Asia and the Middle East, um, many of whom are African American, to talk about uh, the idea and construction of blackness and their own personal experiences navigating the halls of uh, academia and professional work uh, around the world. Uh, and Paige Cottingham Streeter is a, an incredible uh, speaker to address this topic. She is the executive director of the Japan US Friendship Commission uh, and has worked uh, in the, the space between Japan and American relations uh, for decades doing really incredible work, uh, a lot of which I think we're gonna hear about today. Uh, so I would love to turn it over to you, Paige, uh, and I'll start up your PowerPoint right away if you'd like me to. That'd be lovely. Thank you. And Ambassador Stevens, and thank you so much to hear from you about all the things you're doing. I'm looking forward to learning more. I wish we could be on campus together, but um, it just offers another opportunity for an engagement. And Morgan, thank you for the invitation. When you suggested the idea back in the summer, it seemed like January would be such a long way off and here we are. And so much has happened between then and now. Um, so there's definitely um, a lot on my mind, a lot I'd love to share with your audience. So let me just jump in. And in addition to my thanks for the invitation, just to acknowledge that, you know, I am one black woman speaking from my own experience and perspective. And I suspect if you spoke to others, you might um, hear other uh, life experiences, but I'm happy to share my own. I'm also happy to share what I've learned along the way with respect to Japan and US-Japan relations. And it's really been my passion and life's work to be a bridge and to be somebody who can connect the two countries um, and cultures in our efforts mutually to provide peace and security in the Asia Pacific region, as we like to say. So if you'll move to the next slide, I'll just outline my intention to cover a few topics. Um, I'll speak about my own individual experience um, engaging with Japan and also some work that I've done in my previous work with respect to African-American Japanese relations that some may be aware of, but others may not. And also talk about public diplomacy and public service. That's the space where I have found um, my greatest value and where I believe the commission and the other entities that I'm responsible for have been able to make tremendous impact. And then I just really like to think a bit about the future. 
Um, and there are so many ways of potential engagement between the United States and Japan. And I think that that will look perhaps a bit different than it has in the decades leading up to where we are today. So thank you again for the invitation. And if you'll move to the next slide, I'll just give you a little bit of um, background about my own journey. How did I arrive in this place? And it really began um, with a family vacation to Japan back in 1970. I was an elementary school student. Japan was hosting the World Expo. It was to take place in Osaka, Japan. And thanks to a family that really believed in education and personal experience, I had the opportunity to travel there. So my dad had served in the Korean War and spent some time in Japan when he was not in combat. And my mom had been and was an educator. And so when the two decided or learned that Japan would be hosting the expo, my dad said, I wonder what Japan is like now after that time that he experienced in the 50s. And so my mother said, well, why don't we go find out? And there we decided to pack up this black family standing out for all kinds of reasons. Not many Americans were traveling to Japan at that time, certainly not many black Americans. And we come in all different complexions. And my brother as a young five-year-old had a full Afro that was bright red. So needless to say, we stood out. But that experience was life-changing. I grew up in the New York metropolitan area. New Jersey is my home and New York was our backyard. And so I was accustomed to big cities and I knew what it was like to see skyscrapers and the hustle and the bustle. But what intrigued me was the fact that it felt similar, but yet was so different. People who looked different, people who spoke a different language, and it really made me curious and want to know more. And so that was really the beginning of my journey to say, I'm interested in this country and what else is there to learn? And so coming back to the United States, doing a summer report about Japan, and then moving on to high school where I had the wonderful pleasure of encountering a teacher, Mr. Bigelow, who offered an Asian studies class. And I took that class out of my interest, but it really sort of ignited a passion. And I wanted to continue studying about Japan and ended up deciding to go to a college Connecticut College in New London that had a strong Asian studies uh, component and Japan was a part of that. However, I had the intention of becoming a lawyer and knew that I was interested in international affairs and thought that French as the international language was the language that I should master. And so all the way through high school and into my sophomore year in college, I was studying French with the intention of double majoring in government and French with the expectation of doing a study abroad during my junior year in France. Well, things changed. It changed because my professor, Professor Tom Havens, who some of you may, in the field may know, really just inspired me, encouraged me, um, and motivated me to take more Asian studies classes. I also became active in student government and therefore decided to run for president of the student government and won in my junior year, which meant that I was no longer going to be able to take that study abroad as I had intended. So I changed my major from French to Asian studies. I was a double major with government and set my sights on pursuing a law degree. And so after college, I went to Japan, to, excuse me, I went to law school immediately, George Washington University and completed the three years, found myself employed by a federal government agency. And as some people would imagine, feeling secure, um, developing a lot of legal expertise, but not in international affairs and the field that I wanted to pursue. And so I was studying Japanese at night and learned about the JET program. Now it's more than 30 years old at the time it was the second year of the program. I was studying Japanese in the evening and learned about this um, opportunity to teach English and decided I'm young in my career before I become entrenched pursuing tax and federal law enforcement law. 
let me see if Japan is really that country that I want to develop a professional um, experience with. And so I took the Japanese government up on their generous offer to assign me to Mie Prefecture where I worked in the Board of Education and taught English to high school students living fully immersed in Japanese community. And that really was the next transformative experience for me because it was there that I was able to piece together a lot of what I had learned in my academic training but actually experience on a day-to-day -day basis. I had the chance to not only practice some of my Japanese because after all I was teaching English, but also to just navigate through the cross-cultural communication challenges and navigate through being an outsider in Japan, a country that you know, is known for being um, group-oriented, um, somewhat insular. And here I am in the rural part of Japan where people hadn't seen a lot of Americans, let alone foreigners, Black people. And this was 1988. And at the same time, there was a US presidential election underway. Jesse Jackson had named himself as a candidate or declared himself as a candidate. We had the Olympics taking place. And so there was certainly a lot of coverage about sports. And so people just followed me and assumed I was an athlete. Um, but over time, they got a chance to get to know me as their teacher, my students, and I develop a wonderful rapport. The teachers and I had our own rapport, and I had the chance to practice a martial art, which gave me a whole nother way of getting to know um, about Japanese culture, but also ingratiating myself with the community. I stayed for one year. Any of you who are familiar with the JET program now know that some people stay for even longer. But for me, I thought it was time to um, make a move either in the direction of my chosen profession of law or to think about other ways that I could sort of involve Japan in my professional work. And so I came back to Washington DC really more emboldened and more committed to being a bridge between Japan and the United States. And the way I found that I could best do that was um, to work on Capitol Hill for a member of Congress. The work that I had done previously was in litigation. And for me, the world was more than a zero sum of spending many hours drafting pleadings and making a decision if somebody is right or somebody is wrong. I felt that if I'm going to dedicate so many hours of the day to my work, I really wanted to feel like I was making a difference. I really wanted to see if I could help two countries who in the 80s and 90s were at loggerheads on a variety of issues and trade um, and the economy uh, were certainly at the forefront. Some of you may remember that in the 1980s, there was an incredible trade deficit and Japan was uh, attributed to being the cause of some of that, a lot of that. There were protests by manufacturing companies, um, particularly automobile companies and laborers. Uh, some of them were smashing Toyotas on Capitol Hill because of the allegations and accusations that Japan was gobbling up the United States economy and engaging in and participating in unfair business practices. So this was a time when I really felt that I might play a role, a meaningful role, and not exactly sure what that would look like, but really happy to serve. And Congressman Payne was on the Foreign Affairs Committee. He was also on the Education Committee. And those are two issues that were really important to me at the time. And so I was honored to serve as his legislative counsel and legislative assistant for a year. And at the time while I was there, and by the way, um, Congressman Payne is no longer with us. He is, was an African-American and so as a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, he was very committed to and vocal about um, international affairs, but also matters to do with um, race and equity and had close ties to some of the various organizations, national um, as well as um, local that were committed to promoting political and, and economic um, equality for African-Americans. And one of those organizations was the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. And that organization at the time was headed by Eddie Williams. Eddie Williams was the founder 
and the Joint Center was recognized as the Black think tank to focus on Black political and economic relations. And so as a result of that, they started to look into this issue of Japanese um, and US trade friction and particularly the impact it had on African-Americans. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I wanted to just note now that I was tapped by the Joint Center to lead a program called the US-Japan Project to work on um, US Black American and Japanese relations. So this space of public policy and public service really fit nicely for me. And I found like, I found that sweet spot where I could in fact have some impact, which has led me to other work that I'll also um, mention with a source of pride. Um, as Dyer, I left the Joint Center, I moved on to the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation after the US Congress had established a fellowship program. The fellowship was designed specifically to make sure that within the federal bureaucracy, there is a core of US government officials who had knowledge and expertise about Japan. Again, out of concern that Japan was really more uh, informed about the United States and able to advance its interests in a stronger way than Japan was able to with respect to Japan, the United States Congress wanted to find throughout the bureaucracy um, the strength to have people who had proficiency in Japanese language and knowledge about the Japanese decision-making process. So I left the Joint Center in 1994 and in that year launched the Mike Mansfield Fellowship Program and spent the next 16 years building and growing that program and selecting US government employees of whom now there are more than 100 who have spent a year working inside the Japanese government, truly getting a deep insider's understanding about how the Japanese government works and have developed colleagues as well as professional friends who they can call on when issues emerge. And that's the beauty and the thing that I like most about the work that I do because we're able to cement, first of all, establish and then cement and reinforce those relationships that can in fact promote all aspects of the US-Japan relationship. So if we'll move to the next slide, I'll um, spend a little bit more time later talking about my current work at the Japan-US Friendship Commission and COLCOM. But I'd like to just sort of circle back a little bit because when I was at the Joint Center and when I was um, embarking on this initiative to consider the relationship between African-Americans and Japanese, we were starting from the place where the tension was currently existing. But what we wanted to do was to actually see what the contact had been between Americans and Japanese prior to that. When I was in Japan on the JET program, as I mentioned, I was one of a few. When my family and I went to Japan in 1970, we were one of a few. Now that's not to say that there hadn't been other contacts. Certainly there was a military presence and so people were familiar with that um, representation of black people in Japan. But other than that, we wondered what had those contacts been and what had the relationship been? And part of the question also had to do with the concern that was Japanese prejudice based on direct experience or was it something that was learned? Learned perhaps from the United States, the Americans who either came as missionaries or who came as business people or diplomats and that transferred their bias and prejudice about black people onto Japanese society and the Japanese political core. But what we found out and learned, and it's interesting because in preparing for this presentation, since my work at the Joint Center in the 90s, there have been so much research and some of it actually coming out of the University of North Carolina here and so I'm excited that this topic and this issue has gotten much more attention and that it's sort of shed a little bit of light on not only where we've come from, but also what we may anticipate and think about in terms of opportunity for the future. Because this relationship between African-Americans and Japanese in the early 20th century, as far back as 1905, started out with this notion of solidarity. But over time, it's become complicated where there's also suspicion. So I have here you know, these two photos, one of which um, on my left is at the center, W.E.B. Du Bois, and then on my right, it's 
Marcus Garvey, both of whom spent time um, in delegations in Japan in 1936. But even before then, there was this notion when Japan defeated Russia, the Russo-Japanese War, that here we have this country, these people of color who have been victorious over white supremacy, white colonialism, white oppression. And so there was this notion that maybe we can build this alliance um, with these people and if people of color unite, then what might we, able, what might we be able to do on the global stage? And so I found that you know, there was this um, ability at least to have that face-to-face -face contact that is critical. It also was striking that for many years, even after uh, World War II, there was this back and forth um, potential for race to impact and influence the US-Japan relationship through the experience of Black Americans. If we'll go to the next slide, I'll speak briefly about the work that we did at the Joint Center. In addition to research, looking into what the history of our contact had been, we wanted to get a sense, is there a difference or a shared opinion between African-Americans and white people toward Japan? And remember, this is at the height of uh, trade tension and during a period of time when there were a lot of other things happening in the United States with respect to race. Um, race relations between American, African-Americans and Korean-Americans in local communities were tense. And I mentioned that because when we surveyed the um, people to the respondents, we first had to determine that the respondent was actually thinking about a Japanese person, a Japanese person that's not Japanese American, but the country of Japan. But when we completed the survey, one of the things, two points that I found interesting was that in spite of the history and in spite of the tensions, and there was another complicating tension that I'll mention as well, African-Americans had a significantly high approval rating and favorable rating for toward Japanese. Now, white respondents had a higher um, rate of uh, positivity, but not that far behind were Black Americans. What was also interesting, and I don't have the um, data here to share, but we also asked the question, who do you think is responsible for the trade imbalance? And overwhelmingly, white respondents thought that Japan was responsible for the trade imbalance and the reason because of unfair trade practices. When we asked the Black respondents the same question, a far smaller proportion of the respondents thought that the problem and the fault was on the part of the Japanese. So even under what some would consider the worst of circumstances, Black respondents seem to give their Japanese um, neighbors the benefit of the doubt. That was the conclusion that we drew. And one of the other complicating factors besides the trade uh, friction was the fact that at the time, it, from in 1986, 1988, and 1990, we had reports of high level Japanese government officials using racial slurs and saying negative um, remarks about American minorities and Black Americans specifically. There was one instance when the um, low uh, literacy rate in the United States was attributed to minorities, uh, the Minister of Justice, Minister Kajiyama made a suggestion that the neighborhoods and crime were as high and did a comparison between um, blacks and prostitutes, sort of bringing down the neighborhood. And all of these were reported in the United States press. And so it was well known during that period of time that there was this blatant, clear bias by Japan um, toward Black Americans. And the concern for Black America was that it's having economic implications because many Black Americans, particularly in cities like Detroit, had jobs in the manufacturing facilities. So if your bread and butter is earned by assembling automobiles, 
and the American automobile manufacturing company is not doing well and is being bought out or taken over by a Japanese company, you start to become concerned and you become more concerned when the incoming Japanese manufacturer, whether it's a Toyota or in Ohio or a Nissan in Tennessee, makes a business decision to locate its facilities in areas outside of the community where you live and had work. So some of you may recall in the case of Toyota, the uh, decision was that they had a five mile rule. So the employee had to work within five miles of the manufacturing plant. Well, because of the geography and the fact that most people lived in Detroit, that meant that they weren't eligible for jobs. So there were a number of lawsuits um, against Japanese automobile manufacturers that um, ended up, and also allegations against discriminatory business practices toward women. So this was the environment at the time that we were conducting the survey in and that we were doing the work to try to bring business leaders, Japanese biz business professionals, Black American business professionals, Japanese government officials together to see if we can A, understand each other better and B, find ways to create opportunity and overcome this not only bias, but the negative implication that those discriminatory business practices had on Black people. And I'm happy to say that there were numbers of successes and there were also a number of philanthropic activities that grew out of that work and I would like to believe that um, over time, some of the business practices that are now in place in terms of um, not only hiring minorities, but also the philanthropic activities of being involved in local community grew out of some of those kinds of call, dialogues and discussions. If you'll go to the next slide, you'll see an image of what I was just describing. Um, and I matched up a more contemporary image of recent events with those negative um, racial slurs. So the 1980 comments were met um, with disgust in the US, but also there was silence on the part of the US ambassador um, at the embassy in Japan at the time, it was Michael Armitkost. Now, just this spring after the murder of, of George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor and countless others and the protests that ensued, the Black Lives Matter protests, NHK, Japan's public television station, aired um, a short video with an attempt to simplify and explain what the events were all about. Well, the image there on the left is a still of that video. It did not go well. It is I believe others would agree a characterization of an angry black man. It also fails to tell the reason for the Black Lives Matter protests, police violence against black people. It really is, and there was text to go along with it, but just saying that black people are angry because they're not getting the money they think they're due. And so right away, the social media, respond members on the so people on the social media responded but to my delight um, and appreciation and if you go to the next slide the charge at the u.s embassy in japan we don't have an ambassador at the moment um, joe young responded by saying while well, we understand nhk's intent to address complex racial issues in the united states it's unfortunate that more thought and care didn't go into this video. The characters used are offensive and insensitive. That you would have the highest level government official representing the United States in Japan say to Japan that this is not a representation of our community and who we are. I thought that that was well timed, but also appropriate. And to its credit, NHK took down the video, issued an apology, and did a follow-up program to address and explain about racial inequity and also deal with issues of race and identity because in Japan, they're having this conversation now at this moment. Uh, if you follow tennis, you're aware of Naomi Osaka. She's biracial and she identifies as a black woman. Japan has had a number of um, winners of beauty pageants 
um, who are biracial and identify as Black. So Japan is dealing with this issue of, of what does it mean to be Japanese and who is Japanese, but also dealing with issues of Blackness in its country in a way that it hasn't really had to, it should have, but hasn't had to um, consider before. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. I'll move on um, and spend a little bit of time just underscoring the value of public diplomacy and talking about public service. I already mentioned that there was a role for public diplomacy in the work we did at the Joint Center. More recently in the work that I do at the Japan-US Friendship Commission and Colcon, we are on the commission side um, providing funding to institutions that support public policy dialogues, but also exchanges. And what you see here are just an example of two things. Um, your tax dollars at work by educating and informing decision makers um, in all levels of society and government. But I also wanted to make a point of selecting images that had um, at least one, or if not one, two Black people in it. Because that's something that I think is so critical. We need to make sure that when we send delegations to Japan, the United States is truly represented in all of its diversity. When I was on the JET program, that was one of the questions that I was asked. Well, you know, are you really American? Beside the fact that, you know, I'm not blonde haired and blue eyed, you know, I was just different in so many ways. I'm not a meat eater. So I broke that stereotype of a you know, meat eating American. I'm left handed when everyone's supposed to be right handed. But it really truly was important for us to be able to say when we're sending people to Japan, we want to make sure that the United States is truly represented. And so we provide funding for programs that bring congressional staff to Japan. So when they are working with their members of Congress, they are informed about what the issues are. And so there's a group here visiting Fukushima after the nuclear accident and following up to see how radiation is um, being managed and what's the recovery effort and expectation to bring people back to the community and is food safety still an ongoing issue. And so we have people from all various parts of the country, the United States, because Japan matters not only to Washington DC, but it matters to all of the countries between Washington, excuse me, all of the states between Washington and California. And we also um, participate in and partner with the Maureen and Mike Mansell Foundation on a congressional delegation that sends members of Congress to Japan. And Representative Mark Takano is a member of the commission as well as French Hill. Mark Takano is from California, French Hill is from Arkansas and the two put together a delegation. French Hill is not on that trip, but next to the American flag is Mark Takano. Next to him is former ambassador Bill Haggerty, who is now a senator representing the state of Tennessee. And then we have um, Brenda Lawrence from Detroit, Michigan, and Judy Chu from the uh, state of California, and then Jim Sessenbrenner. So I think it just, and from Wisconsin. So again, making sure that there's representation, uh, which is so important because we need to make sure that the other countries of the world, and Japan in this case, knows that our diversity brings with us a variety of perspectives and also a variety of areas of expertise. And so that I think is something that is critical and something that in my role, I feel uh, passionate about making sure is a priority and our commissioners agree. And then that bottom photo is um, a former group of Mansfield fellows. Uh, and again, just to get the sense that there are men, there are women, um, because being a female in Japan in a decision make, in a decision making role is um, not often the case. Uh, women in leadership are few and far between. And so I, in my own experience with Japan, have to navigate not only being a Black person in Japan, but being a woman in Japan. And that's a conversation that I'm happy to have if anyone wants to. Um, but I also think it's important to know that within our federal government, we have people with, again, a range of expertise on all kinds of matters. When we think about the US-Japan relationship, 
We tend to think about the security relationship, the alliance, the treaty between the two countries. We think about the economy, but there's also the in-between. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. What can we learn from each other? How can we work together? When we develop a personal relationship and know who our points of contact are, when we trust them, it makes it so much easier to solve problems together. And that's why I love what I do because as a public servant, I'm able to support and sustain the US-Japan relationship. And I'm able to do that on a people to people level and also looking at policy issues that affect the two countries. So the last slide, um, the second to last slide, I'll be um, brief, just moving along. On the left is um, an image of an event. The last time I was in Japan was in February. Um, and it was to launch and kick off a joint initiative between the National Endowment for the Arts and the Japan US Friendship Commission. We're, we're there at the US Embassy and in celebration of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, we asked our Japanese, American Jap and Japanese artists to collaborate and show their collaborative work representing the themes of unity and diversity. Um, that is what the Olympics are meant to be about. We are hoping that will happen this summer, um, but um, circumstances um, may prove that we have further delays. On the right, you'll see the sort of roundtable dialogue that occurs um, between our US and Japanese counterparts. ColCon is uh, the Conference for Cultural and Educational Interchange. It's a binational advisory panel. We function by working groups and tackle all kinds of issues. And most recently, we've been addressing the concerns of student mobility. That chart is a very graphic um, image that shows the decline in the number of Japanese students, the blue line, coming to the United States for a study abroad experience. The US is the red line, and that's um, on the steady move upward. But our goal has been to try to double those numbers. We've just finished the report explaining what some of the causes for the decline was, how the two countries can address it. And there's some really wonderful successes um, that are underway that I'm happy to talk about um, later if you'd like. And then just finally, the next slide, please. If we look ahead to the future, um, I think the future is bright. Um, I think it's bright because we saw in Japan this summer a huge crowd, more than one crowd of Japanese people in the streets, along with other exp expats from other countries supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. And the passion that's there is really so overwhelming. And I think that there is opportunity to leverage that to not only bring equity to Black lives in the United States and the Black experience in the US, but also for minority communities and underserved and underrepresented and um, people who are marginalized in Japan. And those communities do exist. And when I look at that crowd, I see a sense of youthfulness. And I think some of that has to do with, again, that representation. When JET participants, when others, study abroad students come to Japan, they have the chance to share their culture and their experience. And that influences their Japanese friends and colleagues who want to be supportive in this very global issue. And we also see Americans, Black, Brown, who want to come to Japan. So it's my job, it's our job to make sure that they have access, that they have support, they have encouragement, because they can go into all kinds of fields. It's not only the fields of trade or academia, but there are so many other engineering areas where they can be useful to serve their own country, but also to support the US-Japan relationship. The last slide is a resource. Um, if you want to learn more about who's involved, their website for the National Association of Black Engagement in Asia is there. If you are Black and are engaged or interested, please visit them. They'd love to hear from you. And please visit the commission's website, Nichi Bay Connect, because that's a platform where one can find what their pathway may be in the field of Japan studies. So I'll stop there. Sorry to go a little bit long, Morgan, but I welcome your questions. Thank Paige, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And uh, can you hear me? 
Uh, and well, okay, awesome. We are getting um, a bunch of great questions. So I'm gonna um, pass them along to you right now, if that's okay. Absolutely. So um, Anne Prescott says, I'm very interested in the historical interactions between black Americans and Japanese. And I appreciated the examples you gave of W.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey. Are there any other examples that would be um, worth noting that I could investigate for my work with K-12 educators? Oh, um, gosh. You know, I the, a lot of the work that's been done more recently is um, uh, scholarly work um, that I'm sure the person asking could find. But one of the um, things that I think might be useful, and I don't know, but at the Stanford, at Stanford University, they do a lot of um, curriculum development for that age group. Um, and that may be a place to start, but I can think about it a little bit more because I don't know for that age group. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. Um, another question, Tom Mason said, Paige, I found your talk fascinating. Can you talk a bit about who you've looked to for mentorship and advice throughout your career? In many ways, you're a pioneer. Who did you seek out for help, uh, given that in many of your experiences, you were the first black woman in so many contexts? Thank you, Tom, for the question. And um, it is a good question. I'm really fortunate um, because I, it's true, I didn't have someone I could look to that was in the position that I sought. And I didn't even know that there was such a position. But I did have the benefit of, as I mentioned, parents who thought, why not? And I say that because we can't take it for granted. There are a number of students who we encounter whose family members say, you wanna go where? You wanna study what? Why do you want to do that? And so that should not be taken for granted. So that's the first issue is just thinking that anything is possible and knowing I had the support of my family to be able to do that. The other is taking bits and pieces of experience. So I wanted to be a lawyer. Well. I didn't know anybody that was, I knew family members who were lawyers, but not in my field. And so I looked to them for guidance about how to check that box of acquiring the law degree, how to find a, a school that's going to be the right fit, how to make sure I'm competitive and prepared. And I, so I essentially cobbled together bits and pieces of what I wanted to do and found people in those spaces. It wasn't until I went to Japan in the 90s that I actually ran into and found other black people. And to the point where I was even in Miyaken once and I was in the grocery store and I saw, I thought a brown figure walking down an aisle. I chased down a man because I had not seen another black person. And then, you know, one black person leads to another. Well, do you know so-and-so, you know? And so it's, again, surrounding yourself with people who are having a shared experience. And that's what's the beauty of alumni associations also. You know, I established when I came back the JET Alumni Association. We all love to share stories about our experience, but it was especially different for Black people. And not that long ago, the Southeast chapter did a whole session and a webinar about the Black experience for JETs. And it's like, oh my gosh, you too? So again, finding people, even if it's just one, that you can um, know that you're not alone and finding somebody who has confidence in you. So I found them in each of the discrete areas of my interest and work. Great. Um, we have a question from our colleague, uh, Heather Ward, who leads study abroad here at UNC and who also has worked with Paige uh, in, in previous projects. Yes. Um, she says, um, could you describe how race, diversity, equity, and inclusion topics may be taught in the Japanese secondary or higher education systems? What is the conceptual basis? In the US, for example, there's been an uh, evolution of the pedagogy. You know, We used to talk about tolerance, then we talked mm -hmm. about race blindness, then we moved on to multiculturalism, and now maybe we're talking about white supremacy. What, what is the conceptual basis uh, in Japan? Well, so I'm not an educator in Japan, but I can share the challenge that I've experienced in the work that we've been doing at Colcom. Right now, Japan 
is grappling with this issue of diversity and concerns about race. And so they would even say, we don't really have a lot to offer. So for them, diversity may be gender. Um, it may even go so far as geography, but Japan thinks of itself as a homogeneous society. And so that's the starting place that's the challenge um, and the complication because we know that there are different, and I mentioned that um, in my presentation, there are people in Okinawa, there are people in the Northern Islands, Ainu, there are ethnic Koreans, um, there are marginalized people of Japanese descent. And so those in my view, and I would suspect you know, the US context would be considered you know, populations of people um, that should be included and certainly um, felt as though they're represented um, and, and people should speak openly about it. But Japan, to my understanding and experience, hasn't even gotten there yet. And so it's really challenging when as a working group, for example, thinking about what are future issues we should be addressing, trying to find that area of connection. Now, that's not to say it's not worth trying for sure. Um, and I do think there are individuals who want to have that conversation. So for me, that's the starting point. Finding individual teachers, um, particularly in the schools. Having the JET in Japan has really been helpful because they're able on a personal level to be able to talk about some of these issues, either through their shared experience or even building something into the curriculum. But it's um, a slower journey and it, they're not quite where the United States is in the conversation. Um, if it's okay, there's, there's one or two more questions here. There's a, a number of great questions and I don't think we'll get to them all, but mm -hmm. one that really, I think, actually speaks directly to your experiences. Um, Joyce uh, Tang asks, uh, she says, thank you for your passion in this. I agree that it's so important to send multi-ethnic delegations. Could you share how these delegations are selected? Thank you, that's a great question. And my colleagues know that um, it's something I care deeply about and I become impatient when I see a draft of a program that has no diversity. And there are people who would say, and we've all heard it, oh, we can't find them or, you know, where do you go? Well, it takes time and you have to be intentional. And so you don't wanna have people just because you wanna have a brown spot. You want to have people because they're bringing some expertise to the table. What's the added value? And so it means a lot of foresight, planning ahead, thinking about what's the purpose of the meeting, what you're looking for, and then having a lot of conversations with a lot of people over the course of time to A, let them know about the experience and the opportunity. If they didn't know about it, why they should know about it, persuade them if they need to be persuaded. But to be perfectly honest, most people don't have to be persuaded to go to Japan. Japan is a place that you know, has so much to offer from great cuisine you know, to great landscape to high tech. So it's just a matter of, not always thinking about the people who you know or the people who you see in front of you. Um, I think I'll just, uh, if it's okay, um, offer two more questions together um, okay. because they're on a shared And I'll be theme. shorter, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, this is so wonderful. I, I mean, I wish we could talk all day. Um, Cameron McKinney says, how might the arts uh, affect or continue to affect policymaking efforts or initiatives to further connect black communities with Japan? I think about how strong and thriving the street dance community is in Japan. So that's one question. Mm -hmm. The second question comes from my, my colleague in Asian studies, Dwayne Dixon, who teaches uh, Japanese pop culture and anthropology. He says, I appreciate how you include black political staffers in these visits and meetings with Japanese functionaries. Many of my black students who are interested in Asia desire a creative connection. What resources or policies are being explored to extend Black creative arts within Japanese culture industries. So in both contexts, yep. the arts as a pathway. Yes. 
So thank you. And Karen is one of the 2020 creative artists that I mentioned. Um, so thank you for the question, Cameron. And he's uh, a perfect example of um, where I'm just so inspired by the possibilities for the future. Um, someone who studied Japanese um, at a young age in a US um, environment and then pursued that passion and is now running his own dance company and collaborating with a Japanese artist. But the arts are critical and huge. And to your colleague's question as well, I think that um, we have the opportunity to uh, make sure, so let me backtrack. The commission has this creative artist program and it is meant to showcase all various genre. And we want to make sure that the arts are represented. But there's also this concern about the next generation and who's filling that. And so one of the CULCON committees that I referred to, one was on education, student mobility, the other is on art and culture. And whether it's curatorial art exhibitions, you have that fantastic museum there, for example. And I know that you know, it has to be curated and there is a whole field and an industry of people who can do that work but a lot of the people who have been the curators of Japanese art up until this point are getting ready to retire. And so we need to think about a pipeline. So we need to think about a pipeline for the creative arts, performing arts, visual arts, the literary arts. There's a great deal of space for people to have the opportunity. So the fellowship that we provide through the NEA JUSFC fellowship gives people the chance to go to Japan, experience Japan and have that influence their work. And those kinds of fellowships, whether it's supported by the commission or the Asian um, Council, um, Asian Cultural Council or any other is also an opportunity because the arts are a whole nother form of expression and communicating what is going on in our society and how we can build bridges. So when Cameron performs, he will be expressing from his point of view what the American experience is through the lens that he offers. I hope well, I captured both of the questions. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you from the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, another sponsor of this event is the Carolina Asia Center. Um, we're, we're really thrilled you were able to talk with us today. Barbara, do you want to add anything before uh, we, we say goodbye? That was just such a wonderful talk. And Paige, I'm one of the people who remembers the 80s when we were so worried about Japan. It was, uh, it was wonderful to kind of go back and all the context that that provides. I get to talk to Paige after this ends. So what I wanna say is thank you for a really excellent talk. Paige, I could listen to you speak all day. <laughs> a beautiful too. style, it's marvelous. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank so you for hosting. Thanks, Paige. And thanks, everyone, for coming. We had a great um, group of attendees, a lot of wonderful questions. And I will pass the questions that we didn't get to today along to Paige just to consider later. So take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Uh, and please join us for future events. Thanks, Thank you everyone. so much. Bye. Bye.